Okay, so what we're going to talk about this week is English, English paper piecing. And English paper piecing is a fun project to do. It's nice and portable. That's why I like to do it. Um, and you know what? I didn't get my sample, but I'll, I'll get it later on. Uh, but it, they're really cute. And they, they're, um, like I said, they're portable. You can take them with you uh, to work on at soccer games or whatever. It was actually started in the 1770s the early 1770s in England, it became popular during the 1800s in first in England. And the first instance of it showing up in the United States was in 1807. And that's when they started publishing patterns for the hexes um, in like women's magazines and women's books. So if you look online for history of English paper piecing, you'll see a lot of information there. Uh, a lot of us think of Paper piecing is being hexagons, grandmother's flower basket, that kind of thing. Well, there's tons more than just hexagons. You can find pattern pieces in what they call a honeycomb. Uh, there's 90 degree triangles. There's half square triangles. There's eight point diamonds, six point diamonds, squares, um, jewel, jewels, which is like a diamond, sort of a a diamond shape, not, you know, equilateral, but, you know, like what we wear, jewels, <laughs> octagons, half squares, 60 degree diamonds, pentagons, you name it. There's all kinds of shapes that you can do. Uh, one nice site that I, I went to was, it was called, uh, oh, actually one designer, it's called Laura Pritchard, P-R-I-T-C-H-A-R-D. And I will post, um, in the comment section on Facebook later on this afternoon, the link to her site where you can get pictures of, of all different types of uh, paper piecing patterns that, besides just the hexagons. Um, well, I went to this one here. This one is uh, it's called one in, we're going to work on hexagons because that's the easiest one to start with, which are what uh, six sided. So this one is a nice one to print out. There's lots and lots of free designs that you can just download the hexagons. You could also buy templates, acrylic templates and plastic templates and sheets full of hexagons. You can print them out yourself. Um, you can print them out on either cardstock. A lot of people use cardstock because then you can reuse it again. People use layers of freezer paper, which is what I use. Some people just use bond paper. And that way they sew through it. And then when it's done, they pull it, rip it out. And those are not reusable. Uh, I've even, if I were doing tiny little hexagons, and if I ever find my sample, I'll show you because I did one half inch sex hexagons. And when they say half inch, they're talking about one of these long sides. This is one inch. I did little half inch ones, they're teeny tiny, and I made a Christmas wreath. I, I think I've shown it before, but um, it was so tiny. I wasn't pulling out those little templates for nothing, no way. So what I did is I got a place where I could print one half inch templates and I used that, um, that wash away like stabilizer that you can get that completely dissolves. You can buy it in sheets and just run it through the printer. And I just left them, you know, it'll wash out eventually. You can also use that rinse away, tear away stabilizer as a template too. And you don't have to take that out. It's going to add a little bit of loft to it, but you're not going to take those out. Um, and like I said, you can get different sizes and whatnot. This one is from a site called littleblackduck.co.uk. And I will put the link also for hers. This is to print out the one inch hexes. Now, one inch hexes is a good place to start. They're pretty, pretty big, uh, but I wanted bigger. And I found this pattern online and I'll, I'll also give you the link to this. It's called a paper piece potato holder. And that's what we're going to do today. These are really cute. And these make nice little gifts because they're for holding a pan, you know, pot lid that's too hot to touch or picking up a potato out of the microwave because what happens is you burn your fingers. <laughs> At least I do. Mm -hmm. And this way you can pick it up and take it out. And it's just made... This took, I didn't even start it till this afternoon. This took me maybe about an hour. 
It took longer because I was writing down what I was doing as I went along. But this pattern is available on uh, in it in it. Where did I get this one from? It's from www.cdd or cddesigns.com. And so this is called the paper piece pothole. I did things a little bit different, but not a lot. You know, there's no pattern. I don't change. I always do. You know, A, I don't pin if I don't have to. And you know, I'm going to find a way to use glue in it. So I did. <laughs> I found glue. So I'm the, this is, you can always download this and it tells you how to do it. I think the next time I do this, I'm going to, this is a little big. I have short hands like nothing hands, right? Little micro hands. I wish the rest of me were micro, but it's not. But I need it to be a little smaller. So how <laughs> I made these two inch hexes, I went to my copier and I just increased it 100%. And then I got something that looked like this, okay? <laughs> and I only need, uh, I think six of them. Yeah, I only need six hexagons. So I just made a couple copies of these. And you just cut out on the lines if you just want the paper. Now, you have to baste it. And when you're just using paper, that means you're going to destroy it and not use it again. Well, I'm going to do some more of these. So what I did was I simply took this okay, piece of paper. And then I took two layers of freezer paper. And I just simply pressed it to the back of it. Two layers, so now it's as thick as a piece of cardstock and can be used over and over again. One caution about using things through an inkjet printer because you're gonna to have to use an iron and an iron will melt the ink and get on your iron. So you have to use like a, uh, I used to use a paper towel to keep my iron clean and keep the surface underneath clean and still used it anyway. And I also found it's hard to see on this. Well, you can see it a little bit. If you look really close, some of the ink bled through. So therefore, yeah, you know, uh, and that's fine if you, you know, you're using it on the seam, this, uh, seam allowance side, then it's no problem. Who cares? You know, it's not going to be seen anyway. So this can, so what I did was, like I said, I simply took, I need paper scissors, my paper scissors. And this one, you just cut out on the lines. I've gotten other ones where you have to sort of cut around all the different shapes. This one was easy. I just simply cut right on the line. Now, if you're concerned, back this next set, I'm going to cut out. I'm going to completely cut the line out. Yeah. So this, I'm just going, instead of the last one, I cut through the middle of the line. This time, I'm going to cut that line completely off. That way, well, it didn't go completely. You could use your rotary cutter. Rotary cutter is going to be a more exact, but you know what? You don't have to be so exact with English paper piecing, especially in this big size. If you have little ones, yeah, it's more of an issue. But with this big size, you don't have to be exact. You've got a, you're working with a lot of bias edges whenever you're dealing with, with hexagons. Not, not all of them will be bias edges, but some of, at least half of them will be. You know, this is a bias, this is a bias. These, you know, so two thirds of them are biased. Okay, and then after you do this, then I have a little board here. And then what I did is, like this is my pressing surface and, oh, I turned my iron off. Turn my little iron on. And then just gave it a good sharp press so that, because one thing I have to say, freezer paper will shrink. So usually what I do is I put the two layers of freezer paper together and press two layers of free, freezer paper, spritz it with a little bit of water and then press it dry. And then that paper will have shrunk as much as it's going to. And then press the shiny side to the back and so now you get a nice, you get a nice flat. And I'm not going to worry about that one inch where it says one inch there. Um, if it is, you can take an eraser, you know, and just, you know, just erase some of that ink away. Okay, so that being done, then you're going, what you do is you're going to sort of put it on the back of your fabric and draw a line 
you know, just take pencil or chalk or whatever and draw a line all around so that you're going to cut it a quarter of an inch away from this line. Okay. Now we need to, I'm going to put a piece of paper on here because this is, now if you are just, just using paper, then what you would do is you would fold this down with an iron, press it, and then you would base this. I'm not doing that. <laughs> so, so you would you would simply, you know, that iron's hot enough, you would just simply press this. Now I'm going to turn it this way because I don't want to get that on my iron. Press this. Press another one. Yeah, just keep pressing these. Yeah, that it doesn't want to stay, which means I'm already frustrated. Which means I would then take a needle and thread and not pay. If you were doing paper, you just simply run through the paper and baste it around. I don't need to. I don't baste. This is what I do. Now I might baste. No, I won't even baste on the small ones. If I'm having small ones that are small enough to make me want to baste it, you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to use that wash away paper and then print it there. So what I do is here's my, where I'm going to turn it. I'm going to put just a little bit of Elmer school glue, not across the whole thing, but on, I take that back. All right. I'm doing this angle. So I would put it here and here. In other words, I'm going to put a little bit. Now my, here's my angle. I want a little bit of glue on this side and on this side and then when you press it down it's going to stay but you are gluing fabric to fabric you are not gluing fabric to paper okay then you turn it around and i'll do the same thing again this is fabric on fabric so i'm going to go in inside where that triangle is because that's going to fold back on fabric and outside on this side and i didn't get it quite even but that's okay all right and then press it. I should leave this iron on this side. Okay, and over here, turn it again. And yes, I usually have it on. One of my favorite things to use is that rotary, uh, that turning roto cutter or rotary cutting mat. And that way I don't have to disturb it any more than I have to. Okay, and then over here. Okay, press it. And I think we have one more side to go. And you can spend an evening just preparing all of your pieces. Now, next week, we're, and then the last one, I'm going to note fabric to fabric. So I have put glue on the inside, this part here. On the inside of the of the seam, okay, and then I'll turn it over here and give it a good press. Okay, now I have some more that I've already done. Okay, see here's here's another one that I've done. If I were sewing it together like what the instructions say is that you have two of one color and i've already sewn that one together and i'm going to show you how i do that now how we sew these together because how you sew them when you're making assembling your pieces is different than how we're going to do the second when we're putting this pin cushion together so like i said if you were see here you've got now you can start to see what a, what like the grandmother's flower garden would look like. So you keep adding pieces and pieces and pieces until you get the shape you want. We're not going to do that shape today, but you get the idea how to, how to do that. So to put these two pieces together, you can you can do a couple things. You they have magnets. You can take good strong refrigerator magnets and just pinch them on this side. And that way it keeps you from having to deal with, um, with the needle thread getting caught into clips. But this is my favorite way, I've always done it. 
is that I simply take my wonder clips. I don't put them here because that's all going to get. If I put them here, that's going to be in the way of the stitching. And you know, I don't have those lined up nicely. I want them nice and lined up. There we go. And I'm going to be sewing this seam. So let me put a little more light here. Now the thread that I like to use, I like to use a thread that sort of matches it. And I like to use this YLI, either YLI or the kimono silk from Superior Thread. It's very, it's very, 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 very ultra thin. And the thinner it is, the better that you can, you can have an invisible stitch. Um, sometimes they're a little hard to thread. So that's when you use those fancy needle threaders that we have. How far, I, it's not that I can see it because I love it. And this is important, glasses. Well, I want to start this. Oh, uh, let's see. Needles. This is one of the few exceptions that I like to use these straw needles. Straw needles are really nice. They're really thin. You can't do this with, um, you know, the, the package of needles that you get from the dollar store or from Joann's that are by Singer. They're too thick and the points aren't sharp enough. I like to use John James size 11 straw needles. They're kind of thin. Okay, so I'm going to start this by inserting the needle right here inside of the, uh, the corner. Okay, I'm only gonna keep and then pull that knot through. So that knot is up inside this corner right here. I'm going to take one tiny stitch. I literally only wanna grab one or two threads if you can ah, just pulled it out good jerry mm -hmm. these glasses aren't helping today either okay see i've got it literally that there i can keep still long enough it'll it'll focus but yep, i'm taking one or two threads and my needle is going co completely perpendicular okay i'm going to take one. Oh, and I just pulled the knot out. Okay. There we go. And I take it, I take two stitches at the corner. Hopefully you didn't pull the knot out like I just did. Okay. Now what you're going to do is the first one, your thread is coming out here. You're going to put the thread in on this side exactly in the same spot. And I'm just taking from the edges a tiny corner of the one. I'm, I'm talking about it's facing you, but we're talking about the one that's not facing you. Then you're going to turn your needle about 45 degree angle and go through one or two threads on this piece. So first it's straight going through here, angled this way. Okay. And then you go in straight that you're going to wrap your thread, sorry, <laughs> going to wrap your thread around, although you don't have to do it that dramatically. You're going to go in straight this way. As soon as you pierce the thread that's right behind the stitch you just made, then you angle it again, 45 degrees, and you just keep going up and down and up and down and you know this is easier for me without and then once that first time you get the clip caught pull the clip out you don't need it anymore and I got to take the glasses off this is easier for me and you guys can see it better and yes I've got this about three inches away from my nose so that I can see it but once you get a rhythm going this goes pretty fast and it looks like I'm always sewing this way, but I'm going in right behind where the thread was and coming in 45 degrees. And you're sort of and then making a knot. Good job. Okay. Now, can you sew this by machine? Yes, but that's what we're going to talk about next week. Because next week, we're going to take this whole process and go to the modern day hexi with the sewing machine which is a lot, and you, A, you don't have to see it as well. So I hate to say it. It 
It is, this is what is also called a whip stitch. But a lot of times with a whip stitch, you're always advancing in one direction. But with the this whip stitch, you're not. You're just going in one direction. And using this fine, fine thread, if you it really does help. And you'll see how invisible it is. Okay, and then I'm coming to the other corner and I'm going to take another stitch here. Maybe one more. And then I'm going to do what's called a loop knot. So I pull my thread through till I see one loop. And I pull the loop I just made through. And usually I do that a few times. Then you're going to embed your thread, your needle into the, just in, under the seam allowance. This way, the only time you're going to have problems with knots falling out or, or coming out of your, of your stitching is if you make, if you cut that knot too close, if you cut the thread too close to the knot. Okay. And so now, it's very hard unless I really pull to see the threads. It's hard to see those threads. Okay. So now, I have done that with this one. I've already sewn that and this one I have. Okay, so once you've sewn that, you're gonna take a piece of, of either batting or insole bright or something, and you wanna trace it on there and you wanna cut this smaller. This is just a little too big. I want it smaller to fit inside the seam. So I'm going to, Cut it out. Okay, here. Okay. There we go. Now the glues that I used was Elmer's washable school glue. You can always use these Fonz and Porter uh, glue sticks as well. Um, I use too much glue before I take the paper out. This is this, and I need a little bottle cap. Okay, and I'm going to take some spray starch and put it in a little jar or in just a lid or something. Then I'm going to take a paintbrush. I'm going to turn it over to the uh, right side, and I just want to do the edges. I want to just paint the edges and put a little I don't want to I don't want to spray the whole thing that's going to put too much water on it I just want to just, just a little on the edges because I'm going to give this a really crisp press before I take the papers out again if you're using there is nope that one's not wet sometimes it's hard to tell <laughs> okay Okay, and then you're going to take your iron and give it a good press. Before I dump it. Does anyone have any questions? Feel free to. Let's see. <laughs> Robin likes the shortcut. That's, our, you know, I'm in the modern world. I ain't got time to do things. <laughs> okay. And if your iron gets dirty and mine isn't yet, then what you can do is stop and clean it. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to take the screwdriver and now push out all the papers. Just make sure there's nothing. Sometimes the glue can go through the fabric and catch on the paper. So a screwdriver gets it out. Okay, and then we're going to pull the papers out and usually start at one end and just grab it. If they're small, you're dealing with small pieces and you insist on using a template, then you might need a set of hemostats to pull it out because 
um, my fingers can't get in there where it's real small. Again, you just simply pull it out, okay? Reform it a little bit and give it another press. And now it's ready to be put together, okay? Okay, so now I'm sandwiching this in, putting in the batting. And now this is right, you're gonna be now sewing this part of it right sides to, or wrong sides together. And then I'm gonna flip a few clips just to hold it. I have to put the pockets in. So if it sticks out a little bit, that's no big deal. You can always take your needle and push it in, shove it in between the layers. Okay, I'm just gonna have enough there. Okay, now we have to prepare the pockets. Now the pockets need are going to go here, but we want to, let me see, I need to match the shape. Here we go, I need to fold it in half. So you take one of the hexes after you've pulled the papers out, and then you're going to give it a good press. I also found this to be too flimsy and I wasn't happy with it. So what I did was I took, this is just a piece of fusible fleece, or you could use any kind of stabilizer that you have. Um, Deco bond will work. Cut out another hexy shape out of just that. Put it together and cut it in half. And probably take about an eighth of an inch off the edges. I don't need this to go all the way to the edges and get in the way of my stitching. Okay, now this is fusible on one side. Let me get these gunkies out of here. And so I simply put this inside the fold and get that little thread out and fuse it to one end. And I don't care if it goes all the way across, it's going to fuse and fuse it down. And I missed over here. <laughs> So like I said, it's not, it, it's, these are biases. So you can convince them to go where they need to go. And this doesn't want to stay together. Guess what? Yep, glue again. And I just need to get it through the stitching process. It's fused on one side as it is. So that's good. Okay. And I'm going to, this out. Now this is ready to be used again, but I'm going to cut them down a little bit. The same thing here. Press this. Sometimes the glue can make it not want to, to turn in the proper place. So we have to be convincing. Okay. And put this in here to fuse right up along the fold. And give that a good press. And I'll just put some glue here. And fuse it together. Now here's where the instructions say to pin it. Not happening. I don't pin, <laughs> but I don't have to. I'm going to match up. Now this, I'm going to need some more clips. She says to baste it. Again, not doing that. Matching up all of the edges. And even if they're not perfect, as you're stitching, you're going to ease that mess in. I'm not going to stress out over it. I have four thicknesses through here. And I have this one here, okay. And I'll do the same thing here. I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'll do that later, but this gives you the idea. And that's how it's done. Now, this is to me what takes a little bit longer. This is where you can prepare your, your project. And if you have to go somewhere, 
or if you're on holiday driving to Thanksgiving dinner somewhere, then you bring these projects to do in the car. Some people can't sew in the car. I can sew in the car. My husband likes it better if I sew in the car because then I don't back seat drive or front seat drive because I'm sitting in the front or like, or tell him where to drive. What's really funny is I do tell him to the directions how to get someplace and I have no sense of direction even with the GPS. So I will tell him and, you know, we get lost and then he gets mad and I say to him, really? Who's dumber, the person who doesn't know where, where I'm going or the person who knows that I don't know where I'm going and then follows my directions anyway and then gets lost? Why are you getting mad? You should know better. <laughs> you would think after 48 years that, you know, you just don't listen to my directions, but he does. <laughs> okay, so now you can start anywhere you like. Okay, and I'm the same thing. I'm going, to, I usually start with, I'm going to start just a little bit. So over here where I only have two layers, I'm going to do the ladder stitch just like before. Which means I'm going to come up into the fold. And yes, I knotted it. I often don't. And I'm going to start, start by doing a double knot. Or just a, a little double stitch there. Pull it nice and tight. Okay, and then I'm now I'm going to now on here because I'm putting these two edges right sides together. I'm going to do what's called a ladder stitch, and a ladder stitch is I should have started this further. Is that you have your think of your needle as sometimes being parallel and perpendicular, okay, to your your seam allowance. So the first ones, I'm taking a tiny stitch, just like we did with the back stitch. And I'm going, until I don't see it, it needs to be tight. First couple stitches need to be pretty tight, okay? And that's tight. And I'm losing. If you're losing your knot, <laughs> which mine keeps falling off, what you do is you take the end that keeps falling off and make a loop. And this is going to be hard. I have to do it with this finger because I uh, cut my finger chopping onions yesterday and it still hurts. And then you literally take, take the loop in your fingers and then you're going to pierce the thread. And sometimes this really super thin stuff is kind of hard to do, especially on camera that I'm not right in my face. Okay. I have to stop trying to eat there oh, if you can see that i see see this over here where it's darker okay can you see i don't know if you can see that that my thread here's the tail of it on the same side as the point of the needle and i have pierced the thread twice then you slide that piercing down the needle and it's going to stay and you can move it up and down i'm gonna grab the Come on. I have no, can't grab anything today. Just try to grab the end of the thread and pull it down. And I'll just make the loop bigger there. You can usually can slide it down, make it shorter. If I could grab it and I can't with a finger <laughs> cut, it doesn't want to go. Oh, well. So anyway, that now that won't come off. So if you drop your needle or drop your thread, it's not going to go into the carpet, making people upset. Okay, so now I'm going to do a ladder stitch. So let me see if I can draw this. I need a pen. It's not a pen. Here's a, it's a friction pen, but it'll work. Okay, so here's my edge of my, the two edges of my fabric. Now let me draw them bigger bigger and bigger okay this is one layer and one layer so i've taught i've stitched a couple times straight across this way then on one end i'm going to take my needle and go inside the fold about an eighth of an inch 
Then I'm going to take it and go take your needle and go this way perpendicular and go through two layers. Then I'm going to take it and run your needle through this way. This is essentially called like a rocking stitch. So, and that in, in essence, however, when you are having just two layers together, you can rock your needle and do the same thing. And now I've lost the end of the needle. Here we go. So this essentially does the same thing that I am going in perpendicular and I make a little, and then I come to the back, grab it in the fold, rock it. And I can usually get about four stitches before I have to pull the thread out. And that's going to work. This is actually how, whenever it says sew something together, you know, you have to sew the seam closed together. This works on pillows and openings to something that you're stuffed. Okay, where are you? Get out of here. There. <laughs> okay. And so, like I said, I am, then I start, this one ended in the back. So I am going to come forward and just rock that needle back and forth like you're weaving it through the two sides until I get to the corner, okay? And no, I don't have a thimble on. Now, when I get to the corner, I'm now having to deal with this pocket section. So there I'm going to grab, I want to grab all four, all three sections, all four sections. And sometimes I might just have to string it through. So this one's the perpendicular. Pull it tight. Usually at a corner, I'm going to do that twice because there's going to be some stress there. Okay, and now I'm going to start the rocking. So I'm only, now this time I've got four layers. So I have this one, this one, this one, and the outer layer. So my needle's going through all four layers perpendicular. Then I take the one, this one I'm doing for four layers. I have to do this in stages. So I'm going to take that little tiny stitch along the fold of one side. Then I'm going to take that needle and go through this way. Then I'm going to take the needle and go this way. And then through four, the only time it goes through all four layers is when it's going across. You have one layer, then four layers, one layer, then four layers. And that way, and I am getting this caught everywhere, okay? I take it, I will pull that thread every time because I'm also trying to make these layers to put together, which they're not, if they're not quite even. There, and pull it through. This through. Here, and you guys are going. <laughs> No patience today do I and then I'm just literally taking one or two threads off the fold on each of these four layers until I get all the way across. now this is what took time this is where it took more time than I liked it to do where I did threaten to get the sewing machine out and just zigzag over the edges which is probably what I'm going to do tomorrow <laughs> okay so now see but that's actually I want you every maybe half inch or so or inch, give it a nice little tug. And see, those layers are not, they're nice and firm. Here's uh, like, I'm not going to continue stitching. And then uh, I'll continue that ladder stitch with the piercing until I get to this other side. Then along this end, I can rock it. I can rock that needle through the layers until I get to this side. And then just knot it and you're done. Where's the one that's finished? Here it is. So this is pretty sturdy. I mean, I'm tugging on it. It's not coming out. It's actually very sturdy stitch, even though I'm using this ultra fine thread and this ultra fine needle, that's going to hold up and it's going to hold up to washing. You don't have, you don't need to, uh, to quilt this through. You could, if you wanted to, I don't want to, I'm not going to do it, but this is all ready to use. And so this was a nice quick little gift. It's a nice little gift and it's something you can do uh, in the car or watching a football game or watching TV or whatever. I like, And you can use up scraps. 
I really like being able to use up scraps <laughs> because my house is not inundated with scraps. Okay, uh, next week we're going to do English paper piecing, but we're going to do it by machine. Yeah, uh, and we'll talk more about it. You could use your templates, but even better, what we're going to do is I'm going to go to IQ Designer, and I'm going to make these, have them all put together, and then stitch them all by machine. And I just threw that on the floor. <laughs> so, so it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, I will see you guys on Saturday, if not next Thursday, where we will finish off more paper piecing a whole lot easier than by hand. Although I still love hand work and probably always will. Okay, so anyway, I will talk to you guys later. See you.